up, and he can't figure out why. So try to imagine a sheet of paper like this, and imagine that you're an ant and you're living on that sheet of paper. And we'll pretend for a minute that you're a two-dimensional object, because in reality an ant is three-dimensional, but he can't necessarily perceive what's going on above him. If I were to take a magnifying glass and hold it up between the sun and the piece of paper, and that energy came down and hit that piece of paper, it would create heat in a very specific pattern, a circular pattern. Now this ant can come crawling along, and if he hits that, he's going to feel it. In fact, he's going to be able to walk around and measure the dimensions of that energy. But he has no idea where it comes from. All he can do is see it, feel it, and measure it. He has no idea or no perception of where that comes from, and that's basically what we're talking about when we're talking about higher dimensional physics or hyperdimensional physics, as Richard likes to call it. So we can see the effects, and that's what we think we're seeing in these energy upwellings on different planets and that sort of thing. It has to do with spinning processes and, and all sorts of interesting stuff. There's, in the book, we talk about Einsteinian um, uh, tensor torsion fields and things like that. And if you really want to get into depth on that, I would advise you to go read uh, chapter two of the book of Dark Mission. So what you have then is this concept of these tetrahedrons being somehow driving physical forces in the universe. This is what's called a double star tetrahedron. It's just basically the same shape uh, of a tetrahedron encircled by a sphere. And again, you've got the 19.5 degrees touching. This is another artistic representation of what's called a double star tetrahedron. And again, having it circumscribed. But it's more commonly uh, known as we take it into two dimensions. If you take that three-dimensional object and flatten it in two dimensions, you get this, which is pretty much known as the Seal of Solomon, the Star of David, um, the, you know, the Flag of Israel. And what I want you to notice is that as well as this uh, triangular shape, this dual triangle shape that you have here, in the middle you have another shape, which is a hexagon. So other mathematicians had been working on this problem of higher dimensions, higher spatial dimensions, higher realities. And one of them was a guy named Coxeter, HMS Coxeter, which sounds like a ship and Star Trek, but in fact it's not. Um, and what he said was, is that for any system, and when he says system, he means, for instance, the solar system, because in his hyperdimensional physics, everything is connected. All the stars and planets are connected, and they're influencing each other. He said, look, if you're going to have these visible upwellings of energy coming through from the other uh, dimension, you're also going to have a point where energy from this dimension is going to go out and it's gonna, uh, that inwelling point is going to be hexagonal. So guess what? On Saturn, there is a hexagonal cloud pattern on the North Pole of the planet, which has been spotted there from the time that we first observed Saturn up close, which is on Voyager in 1989. You can see it vaguely here. That is a real cloud pattern. These are the Voyager images, and what's happening is these clouds are actually making these turns and making this hexagonal shape, and there's absolutely nothing in physics as we understand it today that can account for that. There's nothing. So recently we went back and here's what the Cassini probe found just last year, which again is this hexagonal cloud pattern in the North Pole, which again seems to imply that the planets are following uh, rules of physics that we do not fully understand or at least we don't have any real um, model for. Here's another image from Cassini and here's actually a movie of this, and you can, you can see that the outer clouds are moving a little bit faster than the inner cloud. It's actually turning at a lower rate, and it's maintaining its hexagonal shape, and there's really nothing that can account for this except this weird, bizarre topological math mathematics. Um, a couple of other things I wanted to talk about real quick. Uh, Faraz's presentation, she talked about um, water rituals and healing rituals and things like that, and there was an, actually a guy named Dr. Hans uh, Jenny who did something that's now commonly called somatics. And what his experiments involved was taking particles and suspending them in fluid or taking sand and putting them on metal plates and then vibrating those fluids or vibrating those plates at different frequencies. And when he would do that, he'd find that the sand or the particles would organize themselves into these geometric shapes. And very commonly you had, well, this one I just thought was so cool. I just wanted to put that one in there. It's not really got anything to do with it. But at certain frequencies, you'd get hexagonal shapes in the middle. And then later on, one of the ones that I thought was really, really interesting was this one, which again, you're seeing this double star tetrahedron shape. This is one of the water uh, particulates, and it just basically forms itself along these geometric lines. So it had, seems to be implying that there is a physics involved with vibration. And of course now, you know, the big thing in physics today is this uh, string theory, which is that we've all got these vibrating strings inside of us that are tuned to different frequencies and all this stuff. And gee, guess what? It's basically just sort of the poor man's uh, version of hyperdimensional physics, what Maxwell was working on back in the 1800s. So 
there seemed to be a message to this mathematics of these ruins at Sidonia, and that message seemed to be a couple of things. First of all, the tetrahedron is the base building block of the physical universe, and there's a lot more about that in the book. Right now, in fact, there's even been some mathematical modeling they've done that they think that the atoms inside of you, the nucleus of the atom, which of course nobody's ever seen, they expect it now when they find it to not be the little round rubber ball that we've all you know, seen in our a atom diagrams and movies when we were a kid in school. They expect it to be a double star tetrahedron. Now, of course, they're not connecting it to this other stuff, but I think it does connect. And the other message was, look, higher spatial dimensions exist, and if they do exist and there's energy coming through from them, what that means theoretically is that you can master that energy. You can have unlimited energy. You can control gravity which would explain a lot of the stuff we see from UFOs, flying saucers, some of their behavior, which seems to be outside of our known laws of physics. Okay, so um, back to artifacts. Uh, it looked like in the early 1990s that this subject was going to be settled. We had a new probe going to Mars called Mars Observer. This is it. And it was going to be going in 1993 and taking high-resolution pictures of the surface of Mars. The problem was NASA had no interest in taking any pictures of Sidonia or the face. In fact, they were really, really hostile to the idea. It got to the point where they would send people out, like here's Dr. Stephen Squires, who now runs the Mars Exploration Rover program over at JPL. He's uh, Carl Sagan's protege at Cornell. They sent him out to debate Richard and some other people on the question of Sidonia. This is a great one. Um, I, Richard's got these videotapes, and I'm trying to get them for the, the special edition of uh, Dark Mission to put them in a DVD so people can actually see this. Because at the end of this debate, what happened was the squires had to admit that he never actually looked at any pictures of the face or of Sidonia. But he was out there claiming there was nothing to it, even though he'd never looked at the pictures. Now, the whole thing um, came to a head in early 1993, right before Mars Observer was going to power itself into orbit and begin its initial science phase or pre-science phase and start taking pictures. They sent out Dr. Bevan French, who was the uh, chief project scientist on the Mars Observer program, to debate Richard on Good Morning America. Um, his position was... Try, he was trying to defend the position that basically this one guy, Dr. M Dr. Michael Malin, should have total control over all the images taken by the Mars Observer and should not have to release them and should have total autonomy over what should and should not be taken um, with basically a space probe that you and I, with our tax dollars, paid for. At the end of the whole thing, uh, Richard again mopped up the floor with them. The host, Bill Ritter, finally said, look, Dr. French, why don't you just take the pictures, immediately release them, not embargo them, and then prove these guys wrong if they're wrong. And, of course, French didn't have an answer for that. Well, what happened after that was really, really interesting because about two minutes after they went off the air, after French had lost the debate just the way that Stephen Squires had lost his debate with Richard, Mars Observer disappeared. Or, more precisely, they claimed that it had disappeared 14 hours before. Now, I don't know. If you're the chief project scientist, I, I find it hard to believe that you don't know that your probe has been missing for 14 hours when you go on national television and debate the question of artifacts on Mars. It seems to me that he could have gone on there and said, look, uh, we really can't talk about Sidonia because we're not even sure if we have Mars Observer anymore. It disappeared 14 hours ago. We can't communicate with it. That would have changed the whole thing. Instead, he goes on. He tries to win the day. He gets creamed in the debate. And then, guess what? They pull the plug on the thing right after that. Now, I think that's exactly what happened. They never did determine what happened to Mars Observer because they turned the telemetry off. They turned off the radio right before they did this deorbit burn. They came up with a couple of possible scenarios. I think James Oberg, big bloated sack of protoplasm from NASA. Um, did I, did I get, do you guys get the impression I don't like him very much? He, he tries to claim, well, they know exactly what happened. Well, they don't have the slightest idea. And the reason they don't have the idea is because for some reason they turned the radio off. And to me, it's pretty obvious. They turned it off because they didn't want anybody to know that they either A, took the thing black, or B, blew it up themselves. One of the two. Because they couldn't face the reality of what they would have to take pictures of, because the pressure at that time was enormous. Now, this is a pattern that's, that's continued to today. We have the Phoenix lander on Mars, and if you might remember, back in uh, 99, I want to say, there was something called Mars Polar Lander. Well, Mars Polar Lander was supposed to do the same thing that the Phoenix lander is now doing um, on the poles of Mars, but it also disappeared. And then, mysteriously, NEMA, who that guy Errol Torin works for, came along and said, well, we found Mars Polar Lander, and it's right here, and it's perfectly fine. And NASA said, oh, no, 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 no you couldn't have found it. It's, it's, so the pattern seems to be, and there's a couple other probes that are like this, is they send one probe to Mars, 
it fails, quote unquote, and then they send another one. And I think what they're doing is they want to go and look for themselves first and find out what they're going to have to tell people before they do the public one. And I just think that.